Please pray with me. May these words that I speak be grounded in my soul, encouraged by the God presence in me. And may these words that you hear be captured by your soul, enlivened by the God presence in you. Amen. The Sunday before Christmas, and then again at the early service Christmas Eve, we heard Luke's story of the birth of Jesus, the familiar tale of angels and shepherds, stables and mangers. I shared my belief that this story, which I love very much, is not historical fact, but rather is a story rich with symbols of the reign of God on earth. This morning I shared Matthew's birth story, this one that's on the floor before us, which has over the centuries become enmeshed with Luke's story, even though they are very different and separate accounts of Jesus' beginnings. And once again, I have to say that this is not a story of historical fact, far from it. But that should not make the story any less important to our understanding of this Jesus of Nazareth. Unlike Luke, Matthew assumes Mary and Joseph lived in Bethlehem, in a specific house over which a star pauses. Matthew deals later with Jesus' Galilean upbringing by moving the family there. But the reality is that in first century, first century Mediterranean culture, no one moved to Galilee. No one hardly moved at all because you were expected to live and die in the place that you were born. That's the way the, the culture worked. The only migration that ever happened was to Jerusalem and not to a poor northern backwater town in Galilee. And even if wise ones, kings in fact, did come from faraway lands, they would certainly not bow down before a carpenter's son, let alone leave gifts of such value. And then there is this star that, is, that has the ability to move just fast enough for the Magi to follow for thousands of miles, and then come to a full stop right over the home of Mary and Joseph. And come to think of it, why would Mary and Joseph have remained so poor if they'd received gold? Think about that one. No, my friends, this is not a story of historical fact, but rather reflects the growing power of claims made after Jesus' death that he was somehow heir to the throne of David that throne that began in Bethlehem. And that was a prerequisite for the Jewish Messiah. Matthew instead uses prophetic predictions from the Hebrew Bible, and he uses lots of them, to create the story of Jesus' life. The ecstatic presence of God in Jesus that was experienced by his followers became a light in their darkness, hope in a cruel and violent world. So Matthew lifted out those hopeful words from Isaiah that we heard read this morning that invites all who hear to come to the brightness of God's rising because he witnessed in Jesus' followers a new way of being in the world, a way of love and compassion. Now Isaiah only mentions two gifts, you might have noticed, gold and frankincense. The myrrh was borrowed from 1st Kings, and um, it's clear why, because the, the name Sheba is mentioned in the Isaiah reading, and the Queen of Sheba goes to King Solomon to pay respects and brings spices, and so myrrh would have been a natural thing to add to the gifts that would then come, come to Jesus. John Spong, Bishop John, John Spong, in his book, Jesus for the Non-Religious, says it this way, Jesus' birthplace in Bethlehem is not history. Micah did not predict it. 
Mike is the one who said it would be Bethlehem where the Messiah was born. A star did not announce it. Wise men did not follow that star. It did not lead them to a king's palace or a house in Bethlehem. These magi did not present gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They are all part of a developing mythology that would change Jesus from a child of God to God's only child. The simple truth is that Matthew uses the prediction fulfillment formula 13 times in his gospel. He loved taking those predictions and turning them into story. And actually, all of the gospel writers uh, correlate events in Jesus' life with the Hebrew Bible. Rather than prophecy predictions fulfilled, there is another explanation. The New Testament authors were all Jewish, with one possible exception. And they all knew the Hebrew Bible very, very well. So Marcus Borg says, as they told the story of Jesus and reflected about his significance, they often echoed language and story from Jewish scripture. Doing so was completely natural and legitimate. The New Testament authors used passages from the Hebrew Bible to generate historical narrative. The reality is the phenomenal presence and experience of Jesus, which grew after his death, caused the writers to see Jesus as the messianic hope they had all been waiting for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. What better way to tell his story than to echo the ancient prophecies, where prophets spoke passionately about justice, a new way, a light in the darkness, and hope for a better world. These prophecies resonated with the Gospel writers because this is how Jesus had been experienced in his life. Light, wonder, and epiphany. This is what this story is meant to show us. The star, the simple star, becomes symbol of the power of light to overcome the shadows in our lives. No matter how big or how all how all-consuming they may seem or be. The star becomes symbol of the light of God that radiated from Jesus in his life and continued to radiate from his followers after his death. The wise ones, the magi, the travelers, uh, capture the wonder of life's journey. Each and every one of us is on this incredible journey. And as they venture into unknown places drawn only by a gut feeling that there is another way to live. The decision to step boldly rather than timidly into the unknown, as Jim Taylor so eloquently wrote this week. That willingness to take that step forward. <clears throat> and that is to embrace wonder at every turn. And meeting Jesus, these travelers meet Jesus, the light of the world, and it becomes for them an epiphany. Their bowing before him and offering gifts of great value becomes symbol of the discovery of another way, a different way, a better way to live. Jesus showed us a path rooted in love and compassion rather than fear and indifference. It is a way that is hope-filled and joy-filled where peace and justice flow down like a never-ending stream, to use another bit of the Hebrew Bible. I have also been on a journey this past week, traveling east to my son's wedding, where I was honored to officiate. I, and I too had an epiphany or two during the time in that cold and distant land. I have to confess that I don't much like weddings. I find too often that too little thought is given to the rituals and traditions, and they seem shallow and meaningless for both the ceremony and the reception, and that's been my experience over and over again. And there were a few places in my, my son's wedding where I felt that same way too, but I also realized that something very profound and very real 
can happen. And that was also certainly true at their wedding, at this event. I wish I had kept record of how often someone said to someone else, I love you, over the course of the evening. Of course it was uttered by the wedding couple during their vows, we expect that. But they also offered words, each one of them following dinner, where they publicly expressed their love for each other, for their family, and for their friends. And then others began to publicly proclaim their love. I, I found myself telling both my children and my do, new daughter-in-law that I love them very much. I couldn't help it. I just had to say it. I didn't care who was around. And they said it back. I found my epiphany was in recognizing how important how absolutely important it is to demonstrate our love for each other in a public way, and also how contagious that loving becomes. I had a glimpse of the Spirit of Christ. The dancing that followed felt like a love fest in the best of ways. And I don't really like dancing either. <laughs> I felt in those moments that I was experiencing the power of the Spirit of Jesus just as his followers had done thousands of years before. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but um, the caption above our sign at the uh, road says, Engaging the world in a conspiracy of love. Have you noticed that? A conspiracy of love. Now you might just say, oh yeah, that's kind of cool, or that's interesting. But I really believe that um, love in this world needs to be conspired. It needs to be a conspiracy. Because so much plots against it. So much fear, so much indifference, so much greed, so much anger. And our work becomes to become uh, complicit in the conspiracy to make love the rule. Suddenly the story of wise ones following a star to a little town over a little house to a little family becomes a larger than life experience. As I imagine Matthew the writer of this story, creating his story of light, wonder, and epiphany to try to capture the power and the love of God in the spirit of Jesus. A true conspiracy of love. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.